Hey guys, this is Billy from AdultCello.com and today I obviously have something very different planned for you. Um, we're going to have a chat with Jason Price. Jason is the founder, director, and expert of Teresio. He's responsible for over 3,000 instrument attributions per year, and he believes in a conservative and a transparent approach to expertise. So for those of you who don't know what Teresio is, it's the leading international auction house for fine instruments and bows. It was launched in 1999 and revolutionized the market by combining expertise, the efficiency of online bidding, and a firm commitment to ethics and professionalism, and their goal is to make buying and selling instruments increasingly accessible for musicians, patrons, dealers, and collectors. Today we're going to focus on adult learners of the cello, but Jason, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Billy. Pleasure to be here. I, you know, I had my first question all prepared, then I see these beautiful cellos behind you. So could you just tell us what we're looking at behind you? Uh, right. Uh, yes, this um, French cello, 1860s. Uh, another French cello, a little earlier, uh, 1840s, 1830s, Mirecourt, uh, whereas that's Paris. Awesome. Um, yeah, uh, two, two, two great cellos, many more uh, elsewhere as well. Yeah. <laughs> that's so cool. Um, so, you know, I, I actually did a little research on you to kind of prepare for our chat. And one thing I think my subscribers would love is that you spent your childhood studying cello. And then it, what I found really fascinating, I'd love for you to talk about a little bit of kind of what led you to, you know, found, found Teresio. But one thing I found fascinating was it just seemed like from the interviews I listened to and what I read that you pretty early on had a, a deep fascination for violin making and for old instruments and the, the kind of lineage of the players of famous instruments and the lineage of makers and, and the different cities and the traditions. I was wondering if during these kind of formative years, if you had one or two just kind of aha moments where you saw a special instrument or you worked for someone or something and it just was like, okay, I, this is what I need to do with my life. Yeah, th th there were a lot of them along the way. Um, I, I think my my parents probably had the first aha moment. You know, they they were uh, I think they saw it before I did. When I was fifteen or sixteen, I got my first serious cello, and I, I had played since I was ten. But you know, was sort of starting to realize, hang on a second, I might want to do something with this in in this world uh, with my life. And at fifteen, sixteen, I got my first serious cello, and the first thing I did with it was I took the top off of it. Uh, and you know, my parents had just spent. Um, uh, a lot of money on a very nice cello. And I wanted to figure out how it worked. I wanted to see what was under the hood, so to speak. Um, and I did it carefully and I did it correctly. I, I had, you know, figured out how to do that. And I had already worked for a, for a violin maker uh, for a couple summers by then. Um, <laughs> for a violin maker. But my parents realized at that point that I was, um, I, I was seriously curious and it was probably not going to stop there. No, right. Um, uh, that, that, that led to a, yeah, to the next the next thirty years of uh, exploration in this world, one way or another. That has got to be the ballsiest story I've ever heard about. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, cool. like being a teenager and just like, okay, yeah. let's, let's pop the lid That's, on this thing. And and it was a butter knife I used to do it. It was a really flat carbon steel, but it was just the best type of knife to use as an as an opening knife. But you know, you know, you sort of sneak it out of the kitchen, hoping your mom doesn't see it, and then use it to pry off the top of your. Don't try this at home. This is probably not a good story to tell, but um, that's how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. So, okay, so let's talk about your auction, the auction house. Um, one question I have, and it's just, do you get a lot of adult, like learners, adult amateurs who come and buy at the auction? I've, I've honestly, yeah. I'll be frank, I've never bought at auction myself. Mm -hmm. I really am fascinated by it. Every time I'm on the, the email list, so I get those online catalogs whenever there's an auction coming up and I always peruse all the equipment that's relative to me because or relevant to me because it's just like I'm fascinated by equipment but I was curious yeah yeah we we tried to serve a very wide um, spectrum of customers and we have people who are you know super professionals and this is what they're doing with their life and they're in a major orchestra or they're soloists we also have people who are kind of at the beginning of their career we also have people where it's not their career it's just something they do because they love it um, uh, we have students um, we tend not to be a good place for the very the very very beginners to to buy an instrument just because we don't have the hand-holding services that people need at that point. But once someone knows their way around what they're looking for and 
uh, knows what what uh, you know how to how to try an instrument out. We're actually a really great place to go, um, and we do we do see a lot of adult amateurs. We do see a lot of um, you know community orchestra members, uh, people who have a day job as a as a lawyer, but they can't wait until six o'clock so they can go home and practice the cello. We see a lot of that, um, and, and and we we uh, yeah we we try to try to serve lots of uh, a wide spectrum of customers. Okay, so so for people who you know, so we're, we've now ruled out kind of the absolute beginners, which makes tons of sense because you you know, um, but for someone who's looking for something kind of specific and they're ready to upgrade their equipment, could you talk about sort of what are the major benefits of buying at an auction house or and yeah. possibly the risks versus buying at a yeah. violin shop? Absolutely. There are definitely positives. There are definitely risks, definitely things to be careful of. Um, in general, you have to be able to make a reasonably quick decision. You know, you, we're not in a position where we can give things out for a three month trial and sort of, you know, let you let you get used to it in many different ways. Um, that's the downside of buying at auction. You, it's a much more compressed timeline. The upside is that you have incredible uh, variety of what you'll see. You'll come to an auction and you have uh, you know, 10 cellos in your price range. Um, you also, there is a price advantage. This is, there's a difference between the sort of retail experience and what an auction house uh, does. Um, we try to be efficient in how we sell things. Um, we do set things up when they come to us, but we also leave room so that the next buyer can do their own setup. You know, we, we're not expecting that we're going to have the perfect setup that's going to make everyone happy. We're expecting that people who buy from us are going to know what sort of sound they're looking for so they can find the core of it and what they are buying from us. But then they maybe will take it to their own luthier to uh, have them adjust it uh, to maybe give it a new setup. Uh, for a cello, it's a French versus a Belgian bridge. It's maybe a different uh, neck projection. It's um, uh, think, think considerations that really the end user has to decide, and we like to let people make that decision. Okay, that's great. And um, one thing I was going to ask you is about condition, and I I wanted to relate mm -hmm. the story because the way we uh, actually first met was it was back in 2018, and you were in Los Angeles doing um, uh, evaluations for a Trezio, and I had a, a year or two prior to that bought a cello at a very reputable. Um, violin shop locally yep. that I'm making a name yep. and as I'm playing on it month over month I'm just more and more increasingly suspicious that there were major condition issues with it um it turned out to be the case that I that were not disclosed to me when I bought it and I yep. came to you for an evaluation because I was pretty sure that I needed to basically part with it as soon as possible because it was just breaking down on me left and right and you gave me yep. some incredible information that Good. helped me resolve it completely. So first off, thank you for that. But I, I glad it worked out. yeah, and I, I share that story because just to say that even at a like quote unquote reputable place, things can happen. So yep. one thing I think uh, first time buyers, especially you know adult amateurs, might be a little wary of is like the condition of instruments that that are you know is this like what am i buying because especially if you don't have a background in this yeah it, it is standard practice now whether you're buying something at a, a reputable dealer or an auction house it's standard practice to ask for and to get a condition report when you buy an instrument of a certain level um every dealer prepares one um all auction houses prepare them and uh it's really you know a, a way of um we certainly don't expect our, our customers to be experts on understanding what's a crack and what's a grain line and what's a wormhole and what's a uh, some other uh, p potential problem. We're the experts for that. So we need to give you our representation of what's here. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's a very important part of the process. It's also important not to be afraid of them that, you know, you can get a condition report back and you can see, oh my God, it's got a patch there and it's got cracks there. And it's a 200 year old instrument. That's okay. Um, it's it's the, the next question is how well have they been repaired and is it really a critical issue? But uh, I, I do think that the standard of, of care towards customers, both in retail shops and also in auction houses, has grown tremendously in the past 20 years. There is a lot of really good customer care that happens, people uh, getting good condition reports. Um, and, and as a result, you know, people are making better decisions. Um, there's also a much better standard of, of attributions out there. And this is this is probably the most important advancement that's happened for the for, for the buyer for the consumer that 
there used to be a standard of, you know, the dealer sells it as a Galliano and it's a Galliano because he says it's a Galliano and that just doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it really is a standard of I'm selling as a Galliano because I've done my homework. And I'm certain that my peers will also support the idea that it's a Galliano. It's a much healthier uh, atmosphere for that um, nowadays. That's great. Yeah, I, I actually have a, a I know a couple people who bought instruments decades ago and it was and they just had the they came back uh, to a different shop and they found out what they had actually bought and it was just it's devastating because you know it's like kind of a little nest egg is the, of course you know absolutely uh, absolutely well, yeah. it's, a, it's a much more connected world and you know certainly all the resources we have available uh has has made everyone a better expert and certainly it's held the experts much more accountable for what they're doing which is a great thing it's a great yeah thing. totally um, so I was curious in terms of like, if you go to the auction, you'll get, you, you'll have a viewing so you can, uh, you know, you have it online obviously, but then also you can go in person and view and try the instruments and bows. My question is, I guess for adult learners, it can be a little bit of a skittish thing to have to try in front of a bunch of people because yeah. I've been there where, you know, I, I started at 25 from scratch. So when I was like yeah. six months in, I look like an adult and then yeah. I sound like a yeah. six year old. <laughs> I, I empathize completely. And um, yeah, we when we have a viewing, it's basically an open house that lasts for about three weeks. We have, well, in New York, we have one large uh, viewing gallery and then we have four trial rooms off to the side of that. We book those by the hour. Um, and so if you, if you come and you book a, a trial room, you'll have a space where no one's going to be listening to you. And, you know, you can play as out of tune as you want, or you don't want, uh, and it doesn't matter. It's, and, and I, I think people don't judge like that. Um, it, it's, we certainly try to be accommodating for that. Yeah. And I think it's, it's more in the player's head. It's just, I remember Absolutely. just even being in a violin shop in a separate room and I'd hear yeah. other people nearby and I suddenly get a little quieter yeah. and it's like, fortunately it's not the case anymore, but, um, so, and then yeah. another thing I think to me that was fascinating as I would, you know, I've been following your auctions and, and looking through the catalog, like I've said, like for cool. years now, but Great. The thing compared to what I originally thought about auctions is you say, you know, I bought this cello at auction. So I'm like, oh, so it's obviously old and it's obviously expensive and it's either so expensive that it's like ha 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 expensive to me hmm. for, for my personal situation <laughs> or it's like unlabeled and but it's yeah. still just very kind of rarefied could you talk yeah. to my uh subscribers kind of about the range of instruments both in price and age and yeah. if you wouldn't mind if you have any possible like investment value tips for buying mm -hmm. it like what what's a good investment and what is like more for just you know to be happy as a player playing on. Yeah, absolutely. Both of those are important. Um, there is a lot of variety of what we sell at auction. And um, I think auction houses in general have become a lot less scary and a lot uh, more friendly than they were 20, 30 years ago, much more consumer ready. Um, uh, yes, we do sell expensive things. We also s sell very, you know, reasonable um, with, you know, relatively uh, reasonable uh, instruments. In our T2 auctions, we have cellos, which are, you know, perfectly playable, good investment uh, uh, instruments. And, you know, they, there are some uh, 20th century German instruments, which sell for three, four, five thousand. Um, there are also, you know, very good known makers, modern, uh, contemporary makers that sell in the 15 range. Um, and then of course, everything above that as well. So we, we do try to be, we have, uh, to have a variety of, of what we sell. Um, when making the decision about what's a good, what's a good thing to buy. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the values that we put on instruments for the catalog and the, the, the estimate range, these are all based on the maker the quality of that example and the condition that it's in. They really, and this is a, this is a, uh, for a lot of people, this isn't expected. It doesn't have anything to do with how well it sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, sound is such a subjective thing and it's such a personal thing that you really have to sit down 
and see how it plays for you. And you can have um, you can have a very different reaction than someone else will. It's, it's a personal choice and it has to work for you. So then making the decision on what's a good buy for you has to satisfy both of these things. It has to be something which you want to play, which you feel like is your voice, which you feel like is going to enable you to get to the next level of, of playing uh, that you want to, to, to get to. But it also has to be a, you know, a good use of your money. And for some, for some, in some cellos, a good use of your money means you uh, simply get your money out of it that you put into it uh, five years later. Um, and that's, uh, you know, a good investment because it didn't lose money. For others, um, you know, you you want to pick a maker which you think is on the rise or something that you think is going to, you know, have more value 10 years from now than it does today. Uh, and there are, there are lots of makers and lots of possibilities for that. Some people, when they go and they make this decision, they'll start with the premise that I want something in the twenty to 30000 price range, but I want it to be a maker that I think is going to, you know, catch wind and is going to be more valuable uh, 10 years from now. So they will, you know, simply only sit down to try those instruments. And out of those, you know, you try six or seven like that, and you ignore the six or seven that you don't, that, that are either on the wrong, you know, one side or the other of your price range, or you don't think they're going to be a good investment, and you don't even try them. That's generally a pretty sensible way of arriving at something which is going to satisfy both of those uh, criteria. That makes perfect sense. That's and it's fascinating about how the sound obviously is so subjective. So it's like with the estimates and that it's not connected. Um, okay, so then I have a personal question, not about your personal life, but a personal <laughs> your personal. No problem. Life. Do you yeah. have any like sleeper instruments or personal favorite either makers or cities or time periods that you think? right now is just an incredible value um, yeah. for for what they currently cost? Good question. Um, I think if you looked at trends of what's happened in the past 30 or 40 years, you'd see that this category of instruments we call modern Italian instruments, you know, 1880s to 1950s, has really exploded in price. Um, and I think the, the category of instruments which hasn't done that, which has been you know, perhaps stagnant or underperforming our um, uh, mid 19th century French instruments that aren't by one of the, the big makers. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the name Viome and we know the name Lupo and those makers, their instruments go for a lot of money. But if a Viome cello is now 500,000, why should a, um, a Serde, a, a, a maker, you know, almost contemporary with Viome, uh, you know, a couple years later, suffer such a small fraction of that. Um, so I, I tend to think that there are some really great French cellos that are in the 30, 40, 50,000 range, which are as uh, objectively as good as the big maker that everyone's looking for, a Viome, but just haven't really taken off yet. I think there's value in, the, in, in that category. So, you know, late 19th century French instruments, which are, you know, attractive. They have to be good and they have to work, um, but I think they, I think they will hold their value. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting contemporary makers um, that, uh, you know, are still somewhat affordable. There, there are four or five contemporary makers and I won't name their names, but they're, you know, they're off the charts now. And it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to rationalize um, those prices, but that's the prices that they are. They're also the second tier and the third tier down from that. We're making great instruments and often at auction, you can pick up um, instruments by contemporary makers that are maybe 10 years old. Um, so, you know, on just after their first owner, you're their second owner. And, uh, you know, for better or worse, you pick them up for a discount over what the maker is currently asking. Mm. Um, that's, there's um, sort of a, a, a used car um, scenario that happens with is it's a horrible metaphor. I shouldn't even use it, but you know, a maker when he has the relationship with the person he's making it for charges a certain price, but sometimes that he's his instruments when they come to the secondary market don't achieve that. And then 30 years later, when they're classics, uh, they take off again. Okay, that's that's fascinating. Um, there's value. and then so do you have any tips for? I mean, you've already given so much like tips and advice, but if you could, for someone who's walking into the auction for the first time, they want to just walk away having made the best decision for their budgets and their needs. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, do you have any like tips you would give them for, you know, kind of what to look out for or how to, how to go, how to budget their time, that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, 
I think it, you know, this is true in everything, but it's, it's really important to know your budget and stick to it. Um, so, you know, don't stretch yourself from the very beginning, give yourself some room, look at things below your budget, uh, you know, find things that, um, surprise you, you know, you, you, there's, there's nothing better than really falling in love with something, which is half of your budget. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's great. And, you, you know, the other thing to say is just because we give it a certain estimate doesn't mean it's going to stay there. Uh, I, I it's also can be very disappointing if your budget is 20,000 and you're looking at things in the 15 to 22 range and, you know, that sells for 30, um, so it, it's uh, know your budget. That's an important thing. And and also be very objective and rational with condition. Um, mm. it, it's important to look at that condition report and know what it means so that you're not, you're not making something that you're going to, uh, making a decision you're gonna regret. Okay, that's awesome. Um, so if you don't mind, I'd like to transition slightly to paperwork, um, mm -hmm. which, that, and that's certificates of authenticity. Um, and yeah. Is something I have at this point now dealt with quite a bit because I have some French bows and I have, you know, I, I leveled up my yeah. my instruments slowly, but it was something I had no idea about the first yeah. couple instruments. Could you talk about the importance of certificates of authenticity and then also for um, my audience kind of what price range and and age range of instruments would you expect like a certificate and maybe you know do does it need to be like a, a famous person's certificate versus like you know the local violin shop that's not yeah. renowned it said like here's a piece of paper that says this is this yeah i i think you've 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 hit the nail on the head a certificate is a piece of paper which says this is this it has no intrinsic value on its own the value behind it is the expert that's writing it and frankly the credibility of the firm that um, it's very easy to say something is something, um, but to do that consistently with a really high batting average and make minimal mistakes and fix those mistakes when they happen, that's what I think is the, the real mark of an expert. Um, I, I think there, and I mentioned this earlier, but there, there really has been a shift in expertise in our generation where we're now, the, the people who are writing good papers are doing it um, on a lowest common denominator approach. It's not, there's, there's no longer this fantasy of, well, I think it could be a, um, uh, this maker that we've all heard of, but never seen. Um, but it's, I, I'm certain it is, and my colleagues will agree with me that it is. Um, and of course, there's, you know, there's room for disagreement among, among experts, and expertise is a business of opinions. Um, but generally, the, the experts that are winning these days are those that are cautious. Okay, that's great. Um, I, I also have some questions on instruments because I, I think condition that, that I think also I have a little PTSD to be completely honest from, from my experience, but understood totally. It's... Yeah. I was curious if you could talk to one of the things I found out, you know, slowly as I've been, you know, changing and, and upgrading equipment and, and making switches is that, you know, no two cracks are exactly the same when you're talking about, uh, and when I say crack, I'm talking about like a literal crack in the instrument that's been repaired in the wood. So yep. um, the, could you talk about the, in general, I know it's, it gets very specific, but like what types of cracks and, you know, which ones, if you are looking at a cello, like, oh, there's some cracks here that actually, as long as they've been repaired, that's not a big deal to the price and the value. Yep. And then which ones are like, okay, now this is like yep. a different instrument almost. Yeah. The, the hierarchy of cracks in repair is like this, that the historically it's been, well, let's start like this. In the 19th century, it was really difficult to put back together a soundpost crack in the back and have it hold. That there just, there wasn't the restoration um, technology uh, to, Put together a back crack and have it hold together so when an instrument had a crack in the back its value is decimated and it became something much less valuable now we've we now can fit patches with cnc routers and uh, uh we, we use glues which are you know stronger than the, the the wood was originally and we can do do all of that and make a crack in the back almost invisible but there still is this stigma and for good reason that once an instrument has a sound post crack in the back, its value has been significantly diminished. Um, there are some exceptions to this rule and cellos actually tend to be one of the exceptions to this rule that cellos are bigger, they tend to get more cracks. Uh, they're, they are um, 
more likely to have a soundpost crack in the back than a violin is. And I think most people depreciate a cello less than they would depreciate a violin for having a crack in the back. Um, interestingly, this this same um, this same uh, uh, principle holds true with you know, you, you you might wonder why so many instruments don't have original scrolls and why they have a replacement head. Um, and the reason for this was that repairing a peg crack in the 18th and 19th centuries was really difficult because once you had broken that peg box, to glue it back together and have it hold was just mm -hmm. really tough. And the easiest thing to do is just make a replacement head for it. So maybe you took the original and shoved it in a drawer and then it, you know, got lost to history after that. Now we can make spiral bushings, we can uh, do invisible repairs on the inside of a peg box, and they're no longer a problem, so we do everything we can to save that, but that's the reason why so many instruments don't have original heads. Um, so back to the idea of cracks, which are good and which are bad. A, a soundpost crack in the back is bad. Worm, in general, is something to be careful of. Lots of old instruments have woodworm damage. Uh, woodworm is the, the, the worm, literally, life stage of a beetle. And an insect will fly into your, uh, usually on the inside of the violin, and they'll find a nice dark place and they'll lay some eggs. And those eggs turn into larvae, and the larva turns into a worm, and it eats its way. This sounds horrible, but it eats its way through the maple or the spruce and comes out the other end. And when it does that, it leaves you with a hole in your violin, and not just a, a pass through hole, but like a tunnel. Um, and if, if it has bad woodworm damage, it can significantly weaken the instrument. So, it's very important to, to know the extent of the woodworm damage. It's also important not to be afraid of minor woodworm damage. Just about every instrument of a certain age has it. Um, but if you have woodworm tracks around the center of the back of your of the instrument, it's likely that that could cause a problem in the future. And that problem could mean buzzing. It could mean uh, that the weakness causes a crack. Um, it, it, it can be problematic if it's extensive. I see. And then we, in terms of cracks on the front of the cello, are there, is there like a hierarchy there? Or is it just as long as it's been repaired, you're good? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we assume that most instruments from the 19th century and earlier are going to have a soundpost crack to the front. It's not a big deal. Um, I am more concerned with how well has that crack been repaired, that there are, um, you know, if you if you have a fresh crack and you put it back together, a modern restorer can make it disappear. And that sort of repair doesn't bother me at all. The cracks I don't like are the ones that were fixed poorly 100 years ago by, you know, an amateur uh, luthier on a freight train traveling 100 miles an hour. It's that's never a good thing. They're, they're they don't line up. There's varnish loss. Um, it's not a great thing. So for me, it's much more important to see how that crack has been repaired than to know that it has a crack. And I, I just, this is I've just like, I think I remember overhearing this, that in terms of the sound post patch, I, someone I think was saying that almost like all, almost all the Stradivarius cellos have one at this point, or many of yeah. them do. Yeah, I mean, mo most of the Strad cellos do have a, a, a sound post patch in the back by now. Um, just about all the famous ones that you mentioned. There are some that don't, but um, but most do. And that's why I was saying that we kind of, we depreciate less on cellos than we do on violins um, because it almost becomes uh, expected after a certain age or more expected. And then, what, you know, for bows, I one thing I found fascinating as I was in, this is a reason I'm so happy to talk to you today about this specifically is because for me, I was like scouring the the internet trying to, yeah. fit, you know, this information is when you ask the right person, it's very clear, it's very upfront. And then if you try to find it on your own, sometimes it can be very difficult to pin down the with bows. It's there's a, it seems to be a hierarchy, too, as well, in terms of yeah. the, the bow itself, not even necessarily damaged, but like if the button that you use to tighten the hair, if that's been replaced, that devalues mm -hmm. the bow, the frog, is is that probably the biggest item, would you say? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of parts being original and not, um, again, it depends on what the bow is and how old it is. Uh, but yeah, but an unoriginal frog is going to depreciate between 25 and 50%. Uh, an unoriginal button is going to be 15%, 10%, something like this. Um, damage in bows can be just absolutely uh, 
uh, des can decimate the value if you have a if you have a break at the head, it you know it becomes uh, it loses ninety percent of its value, um, not notwithstanding the value of the frog. And bows are a nightmare for insurers. They really are because they're very fragile. And most, I mean, l luckily, bows are very re resilient, and robust, and owners are generally very careful and very cautious, but accidents happen, um, unfortunately. Maybe that would be a, a possible like player's bow then, is if you find a great bow that's had been repaired well at the, but it's been yes. head break, and then it's, you, you know, you're playing on something you could only dream about, but precisely and i mean so many great soloists pr do exactly that you know they'll play a bow which <clears throat> has a massive break and repair uh doesn't have an original frog but it just plays like a dream um and, and there's there's a lot of value in that okay that's and one thing i found interesting tell me if this is true because from what i i remember i was shopping for bows and there was an issue with one where they they thought it had been made in silver originally, and then it had been kind of upgraded to gold mounted. And you, as a just a normal person, you would think, well, wow, that's gonna, that's more, even better, it's gold now, but it, it actually <laughs> had devalued the, the, mm. the bow in question. Yes, yeah, um, that happens, Th that happens. There, there are a lot of bows that have been upgraded from nickel mounting to silver mounting. Um, and yeah, it, it's, um, uh, yeah, it depends a little bit on what the bow is, if it's going to really devalue it or if it's uh, going to help it. But um, yeah, it's, that, that does happen. So I have now a question for you that's, um, again, like a little more personal. So, you know, in not instrument dealers, but there's a different type of dealer, we'll say, and there's a phrase, you know, don't get high off your own supply. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> um, so yeah. I'm wondering, have you been able to hold out and not get high off your own supply <laughs> in instances where that's wonderful instrument that's just like too pristine, too beautiful, yeah. too collectible to, and yeah. you're like, all right, this one has my name on it. I, you know what? I love being a one stop in the river, uh, uh, on which all of these great instruments are passing through. Um, I don't, I don't actually have that. Uh, maybe I'm not a, not built to be a collector, but I don't have that possessive. Um, I don't need to own everything. I am much more interested in seeing things personally. Um, and I love this. I mean, it's the best part about my job is I get to see so many great things come through and learn from them, learn new makers, um, see instruments. I don't know. Um, I love that. That That's a, and probably an amazing quality for someone who's running an auction house. Cause I, I just know that the reason I asked is I just put tried to put myself in your shoes for a second and just the temptation that I would feel as a as a someone who you know identifies I guess I'll say as a player yeah. you know yeah. just be I I think I could hold out because you know of course you have a bank account too but it, it would just be <laughs> so hard to like no, I I have a I have a long list of instruments where I was so sad to see them go out the door but I see that a little differently. I see that as that's the list of the instruments where I can't wait till they come back to the door and I get to see them next. Mm. Uh, okay, that's cool. Yeah. And then, um, uh, so another question for just in your own taste, I mean, everyone's heard of the old Italian cellos, uh, they've heard of the Cremona school and Venice and Brescia and maybe Turin, and, you know, are there any cities and or time periods that you think should be more famous considering hmm. the output but just yeah. for one reason or another don't seem to be within italy you mean or or in the whole yeah. world yeah maybe the whole world good question um there are some really interesting eastern european schools from 19th and early 20th centuries that we don't pay too much attention to um they're not super commercially viable, but they can be really interesting. You know, prog makers from 19th and early 20th centuries can be amazing, can be really amazing. Um, Hungar the Hungarian school is incredibly rich and confusing and complicated, um, but uh, it's great to see those makers. Very different tradition, very different concept of how you make a violin and what you're trying to do with it than, you know, the Italian school, for instance, um, but they, they, can, they can be wonderful. Um, I also really love, you know, I, I live in Berlin now and, and I uh, I realize how 
we give such a bad name to German instruments. Mm. And that's that's sad because there are some incredible makers from the 18th century and 19th century that, you know, unfortunately we've lost a lot of them to history by people swapping labels and things. Mm. Um, there, were, there were some incredible instrument makers uh, that are really wonderful that we just don't track. We just don't pay attention to. And mostly it's because they no longer have the label they were born with. I see. When you say that about the the Prague or Prague and Eastern European schools, but having a yeah. different concept, are you talking about is that a like a sonic concept? It, how they should sound? Good, good question. Uh, it probably does translate that to a little bit, um, but I, but I had intended it as the way they're made. Um, w one thing that's that's I have found important to think about. You know, Theresia opened an office in Berlin two years ago. Uh, and since living here, I've realized how heavy of a musical, and I knew this before, but it's really sunk in, what a heavy musical culture this city has uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. I mean, everyone who was anyone came through here and, you know, you either studied with Joachim or Leopold Auer or uh, one of the Mendelssohns or, you know, it, it was an incredible musical environment. Um, and I think the makers that were working here were working for good musicians. Whereas if you contrast that with, you know, let's say um, Turin in the uh, same time period, which has was the birthplace of a lot of those modern Italians that we're tracking, I, I don't I have no offense to you know musicians that came out of Turin in the late nineteenth century, but that wasn't the hot spot. So right. I think that the the makers in these places where the musicians were were often making instruments based on how people wanted to sound, and that's a is worth paying attention to that. That's fascinating. Yeah, I remember actually just random, like that just made me remember that I've, I remember like looking at a couple bows by, actually I, one is is mine, it's a, a heavier bow from, by Seafried. Um, yeah, who's yeah, great. LA. And yeah. when, what uh, the Luthier was telling me was that it, part of the reason it was so heavy is that it was made specifically for a uh, studio player who just oh, yeah. was like, you know, you're just like sitting back a lot of time <laughs> playing whole notes yeah. and you just yeah. want something like a, a nice Cadillac that'll drive, drive itself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that, but that's exactly the concept. That's exactly it. it. And it's really wonderful when makers are making for a specific musician purpose. I, I think that's cool. Yeah, totally. Oh, that's fat. So, so you would say like that maybe German instruments are there any makers that come to your mind and i'm just for my own fascination like that that yeah. you would think of as like a like a player's maker that that would be something to look out for yeah good good question um i'm, I'm helping a colleague um uh, write a, uh volumes two and three of a book on berlin makers now and there are literally hundreds of makers here the muckles the dutches um we there, there are loads and they're not expensive um it's a it's an interesting uh a, an interesting interesting part of the the violin business which maybe um hasn't quite taken off yet oh so that might be like a sleeper for in terms could of like, for a player that might be something could, could be yeah interesting yeah. very cool so and then i you know i just for you seem like such a history buff as well as like an expert in violins in terms of the history of the violin and i noticed yeah. that your your website's Terizio. it's it's a great sounding word but it's also the name of a guy luigi Terizio, yes. um, who yeah. has a history and then you're you also have the cozio archive which is yeah. named after account cozio could you talk and it's yeah relate they, they seem like pretty colorful characters and and yes. and relate like kind of who they were in the history of the violin very care, very very colorful. Um, Luigi Terizio was really the first, um, the first violin dealer. He was a he was a peddler who used to uh, go town to town and swap fiddles, and he ended up with uh, arguably, um, possibly the best collection ever assembled. Um, he was n uh, notoriously frugal. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of what we know about his life has actually been mythologized by people like myself who you know have this this envy for someone in the in the early 19th century who could still scurry around northern italy and grab grab up a, a bergonzi here and a stradivari there Th there's a lot of mythology going on here but he um when he died um his collection was 
very quickly, meaning three days later, uh, picked up by Viome uh, and taken to Paris. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, Viome lived off of it for the next uh, next 20 years. Um, Count Cozio, on the other hand, was um, was a nobleman who was uh, became fascinated with violins. Um, and he was also a, a, a cataloger. He created the, this this a series of notes, uh, which we refer to as his carteggio, um, where he said, I went to Milan and visited the Mantegazza workshop today, and I saw two violins by Stradivari and one by Bergonzi, and then he describes them. So he was really the first cataloger of, uh, of violins and violin makers. Um, yeah, two interesting personalities and the romance that they add to the business um, yeah, is, is something we wanted to absorb in choosing them to be the, the, the name of the company. That's awesome. And if I'm right, didn't uh, at one point count the count became a little hard up. And so he actually used Teresio to sell some of his instruments. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the fascinating things with Count Cozio is, you know, being a nobleman and, you know, he had this domain in uh, uh, in the town of Salaboy, which was, you know, he was the 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 lord of the of this you know, small area, but he, he was the nobleman. So it really wasn't cool for him to go around bartering with people for violins. So he had a, a series of agents that he would use. And one was named Barone. And there was, there was um, another one. I can't remember his name right now. Uh, and they, they used to go and essentially do his dirty work. And, you know, they would be the ones who went to Paolo Stradivari and said, you know, Paolo, um, his highness wants to buy the uh, viola d'amore. What's your price? Uh, and then they would haggle over that, but Camcozio certainly couldn't go down into the trenches and do that. That's awesome. Um, well, anyway, so I, I think that about wraps it up. I just want to thank you so much for your time. I personally learned so much, and I know that my listeners Good. will learn so much. It's such a fun, exciting, but can be intimidating um, environment to like, you're, okay, I'm passionate about the cello and I'm ready to like level up, but then... Yeah. It's especially if you get into these like, oh, here's an older cello and it's somehow in my price range. And, you know, and so I think this information is just completely invaluable for adult learners of the cello. We are very friendly and we love talking about this stuff. We really do. So uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, yeah, really a pleasure. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, hope to see you again. Thank you, Billy. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care.